and Wendy Stapleton and welcome to Rock Town, coming to you live from Musicland. Yay! Well, there aren't too many artists who can boast that their very first professional gig was supporting the Rolling Stones. But our very special guest this evening did exactly that. But way before that, I swear, I think he was born on stage. He's done everything, acting, uh, TV, film, music, uh, live theatre. Would you welcome the wonderful Mr. Marty Roan? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that, that actually reads as you look at it and you think, your first professional gig was supporting the Rolling Stones. How do, I'll ask you later how that happened. But Marty, um, you sort of almost were born on the stage. Yeah, I was, I was in a way. My father was a very accomplished jazz pianist. My mother was a singer in my father's, with my father's band. And she was also a very fine musical comedy actress. She used to do um, Gilbert and Sullivan, Mikado, HMS Pinafore, all those shows. Um, and also, uh, you know, so I had, it, I had it around me. I had, a, I had a mother who was an actress. I had a father who was a musician. So I think it only stands to reason that I'd end up in showbiz, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. It was in my genes. Excuse me. <laughs> no, no. Good, good one. Okay, let's start. Uh, obviously, I think, if I'm correct, your dad met your mum here in Australia. Is that correct? Or yes. Uh, after the after the Second World War, he was in the uh, in the Dutch Air Force, and um, he was on furlough in Sydney. And my mother's family used to. Um, invite a lot of the, the Dutch um, Indonesian uh, servicemen, because back in those days, quick history lesson, back in those days it was the Dutch East Indies um, before Indonesia got their independence. So my family used to um, have parties in their home, musical nights and everything, and, and that's how my mother met my father. And cut a long story short, they returned to, uh, to uh, the Dutch East Indies, Indonesia. Uh, that's where I was born, in Surabaya, in Rana and um, <laughs> We came, then the Indonesians got their independence from the Dutch and it was either go back to Holland or come out to Australia. Well, Mum being Australian, of course, we, we came out here. And I'm glad you did. I'm glad so I did too. So you were only a baby, you were two years old. I was two years old. Can't remember a thing, can't speak any Dutch, can't speak any, any, any of those uh, languages at all, unfortunately. Um, so you, you, you were involved in um, lots of things as a, as a youngster too, like lots of theatre... <coughs> At school, I was and... yeah. At school, I did uh, the Mikado. Um, I was a, a choir girl in HMS Pinafore because I went to an all boys school, so I was a choir girl in HMS Pinafore. And not that there's anything wrong with it. Um, and then uh, I did Mikado. I played the Lord High Executioner in Mikado. So I did a lot of that stuff at at high school. Uh, and once again, I always had this yearning. I think I always had this yearning to be in the entertainment industry because of what I'd experienced as a very young child. Um, Mum and Dad used to tell the story that whenever they went off to gigs, I'd go along in the bassinet and they'd just stick me in the dressing room and they'd go out and do their thing all night and come back. So I must have been tapping my foot against the, back, the end of the bassinet, you know, back Absolutely. And I, I, I read that you also um, went on the Tarak show because that was, oh. that was the main... I was on the Tarak show as a kid and it was King a wonderful... Corky. King Corky. King Corky, yeah. yeah. Um, I was on the Tarak show. So I was 13 or 14 years old. Uh, they had a talent quest. I, I came second. Um, and uh, then I went to Channel 9. I was uh, invited by Channel 9 to do a kid's show called Caper Cabaret. Um, mem remember the guy who had the ostrich? Um, Ernie the, Carroll? Uh, no, the guy who went to England, became a huge star in England with his ostrich. I can't... Rod Hull. Rod Hull. Rod Ooh, started, just, Rod started on Caper... Yeah, started on Caper Cabaret. Um, Jeff Harvey was the, was the musical director. Wow. And he was married to Penny Spence. Remember all that? Yeah. And uh, that's, how, that's how I sort of got my, I suppose, training in a way, so that when, eventually, when I did become a professional entertainer, I had many, many years of, of training, I guess. Up your sleeve. Yeah, yeah. So at what age did you start um, actually performing, like, bands? At, at high school. At high school, I was in a, in, a, in a high school band, and we went to Channel 9. I remember this. It was the day before my final exam, uh, which I flunked terribly because I was t already interested in music, too much so, that my, uh, my mark suffered. And it, we went to Channel 9 and auditioned for what we thought was Saturday Date, which was a television show at the time. But it was actually a secret 
audition process for a new record label called Spin Records, who eventually signed up the Bee Gees, Ronnie Burns, Jeff St John, myself included. But on this night, there I was um, at Channel 9, and we did, our, we did our song, and Nat Kipner, who was an American uh, uh, guy, came out with a big cigar, a typical American. He said, hey, hey Murray, I, I like you, I uh, hate the band. Um, and so uh, the next day I was invited into um, Consolidated Press, which was Sir Frank Packer, the Packer family's newspaper, and was told that they were starting this new record label called Spin Records to compete with Festival Records, which was owned by the News Limited people. And the battles still go on, don't they? Yeah, they still do. Um, and so I was signed up to a seven-year recording contract. Can you believe that? Who That's gets a seven-year recording contract? <laughs> You're lucky if you get a seven months. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so I was signed up for, for seven years and then I made all of these records that disappeared without a trace. Um, so I had to wait, probably had to wait another ten years until Denim and Lace and a mean pair of jeans came along. How did you end up with the Rolling Stones? That was my first professional gig. Um, I'd just been signed to Spin Records and um, Sir Frank Packer wanted to promote me and the label and Harry and Miller was bringing the stones out. So Sir Frank apparently had a word to Harry M and said, hey, can you get this kid of ours on, on the bill? Because he was bringing out the stones and the searches and Max Merritt and the medias. Yeah. And Max had just come across from New Zealand. And so here I was, shoved in front of uh, a huge audience on the, on the support, uh, supporting bill to the Rolling Stones. I was 17 years old. That's unbelievable. I was 17 years old, just out of school, and this was... This was all a whirlwind. It was all happening so quickly. And uh, my memory... Of the, I have two major memories of, the, of that first night at the Horden Pavilion out at the old Sydney showgrounds for anyone from Sydney. And it was in the uh, agricultural pavilion and all I could smell were pumpkins and turnips and carrots and because that's where they used to have all the displays. It's better than horse stuff. Oh, absolutely. And this gentleman walked in... Uh, walked in in a black suit and a briefcase and I could just see him in the distance and he came up to me and he said uh, you Marty Rowe and I said yes and he said are you a member of the union and I said no <laughs> he said well you you got to sign up before you go before you can go on stage so I had to sign up for actors equity there and then but I've been a proud member for the last uh, 49 years of the union they found us everywhere they, we'll take a short break yeah. we'll be back soon with Marty Rowe Down, my special guest is Mr. Marty Roan. We were talking about being in the dressing room at the Horden Pavilion supporting the Rolling Stones at the tender, tender age, age, I should say, of 17, 17 years old. Yeah. So tell us what happened. Well, the, the manager of the Rolling Stones <clears throat> came into the dressing room um, before the show and he said, Would you like to meet the boys? Uh, or he said, Would you like to meet the boys? So uh, he took me into uh, the dressing room. They were all sitting on a trestle table, all five of them. Brian Jones was still a member of the Stones then. It was before he died. And they were all sitting on a, on a trestle table, just swinging their legs and smoking. And when I walked into the dressing room, I, for the very first time, I smelt this very strange pun pungent odour <laughs> in the air. And I didn't quite know what it was, but the whole time I was just chatting with the boys, just saying a few, you know, they were pretty laid back, so we didn't get to talk much. But I was going, what's that weird smell? The only thing I can remember is I walked out of that dressing room feeling extremely happy. <laughs> <laughs> was this before you went on? This was before I went oh, on. Oh, <laughs> dear. What were, you, what were you like? I sang very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, that, ha that would have to be one of the highlights of your career, was it? <laughs> well, it was definitely a highlight. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's your second one. That's I've got one to go, one. yeah. <laughs> so then, as you said, you had to wait quite a long time before uh, your big singles came up. Now, you wrote, you wrote material yourself. I, I wrote a lot. I wrote all of the stuff in the 60s. Um, uh, I wrote A Mean Pair of Jeans in the 70s. Denim and Lace... Um, came to me as, as, a, as a country and western demo. It was one of the worst demos I've ever heard in my life. And I said to, uh, I said to my um, uh, production company, I said, no, look, I'm really not interested. But folks, having turned down a little ray of sunshine when Brian Cat offered it to me, 
And having turned down a song by a little-known Swedish band called ABBA called Waterloo, uh, um, uh, I wasn't going to knock back a third song. <laughs> and so I, I said, yeah, look, I'll do Denim and Lace. But I, I, on one condition, I'll do it as a rock song. So they said, well, go home, have a listen to it. So I went home and I can remember driving over the Sydney Harbour Bridge and uh, on the radio came I Hear You Knocking, the song. Hey, you left me long and a long time ago. Yeah. I hear you knocking. And I really liked the feel of that song. And I thought, that's, that's how I'd like to do Denim and Lace. And I got home and I got my guitar out and I created that whining guitar riff. So I did a rough demo at home and I took it back to the studio. I said, I'll do it with the feel of that song and I'll do it with that riff. And so we went in, we got the, the, the band to play it, as you saw on the clip, and as they say in the classics, the rest is the history. The rest is history. Yeah. And, of course, that was a massive hit. Huge, yeah. Second biggest selling, second biggest selling record in Australia in 1975. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Did you make a lot of money? I always use this analogy. If that had been a number one record in the United States, uh, and then I followed it up with A Mean Pair of Jeans, another number one record... <coughs> I could have dined out on those two songs for the, for rest, the rest of my of your life. life yeah. I would have earned a fortune. I would have kept going back to Vegas or touring the US. Unfortunately, it's Australia is a great country, but it is still a very small industry here, and so therefore there just isn't the uh, the money, the population, and there isn't the population. Yeah. So you know that's and that's what I think makes Australians so good at what they do is that we we have to do it against enormous odds. We really do. Um, it's never handed to us on a platter in this country, ever. You had to perform and you had to try and win over that audience. So it was, it was great training and a great grounding for, for artists. And that's why I think Australians are so well prepared when they go overseas. overseas. I really do. You know, you look at bands like ACDC, you look at the Little River Band, and you realise that they've matched it with, with the, best of the best of them in the world. the world. And I think it's because of what we've had to, to, to go through here to get get there. Well, Marty, here's a band that, um, excuse me, actually uh, did their film clip here at Musicland. Musicland are fabulous in as much as they give people a go. They have fantastic rock uh, contests and things here. And this young band were actually on the finals of Australia Got Talent. Sisters Doll, so have a look at this clip. Walking through this lonely town Nothing better to do I gotta open my eyes You were standing there With your long bleached blonde hair Come back to my room If you want it tonight Tonight Oh yeah It's a good day Gotta get up. 
It's a good day to be alive. We'll keep fighting till we die. Oh yeah, we are Sister Stone. And welcome to the dark. Welcome back to Rockdown, coming to you live from Musicland. Well, she's been at it again. She's been out. I've been out and about. And about? Yeah. Would you welcome the gorgeous Susie Pinder? <laughs> hey, Suze, I was just uh, commenting on the uh, fabulous clip that um, you guys Doll. actually did for Sister's Doll. Tell us about it. So she who must be obeyed, our Miss Anita Monk, and Lawrence, my gorgeous husband, and I, together with Mick, had the privilege of coming along and interview, oh, interviewing, <laughs> filming the, the boys. And that clip was actually uh, to be sent into the talent show that they were on. And we were really, really thrilled because they're just glorious young men. Rockdown, we can sort of claim a little um, discovery, a Rockdown discovery, because we were the first to play Sisters Doll on radio. And we had the, the privilege of learning about them last year through Band Wars. So to see them on the tally... They, oh, it was wonderful, yeah. They're wonderful boys. Yeah. So it was really exciting to see that clip. And that was a great clip, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fabulous job. <laughs> Done right here. So if you want to do a film clip, you know where to come. <laughs> so who have you been chatting to? Now, you know I love a good rock chick. Yeah. And you might know the name Johnny O'Keefe. Well, it wasn't him, no, but it was Vicky O'Keefe, his gorgeous daughter who's brought out a, a new CD, I was going to say record, because everything's a record to me, 50 Diamonds. She was the most glorious woman and dressed in leather, tiny little doll she was. Where did you see her perform? Well, they flew her down for the Baronia RSL, believe it or not, yep. so close to my neighbourhood. Um, and there was so much uh, demand for her that they put on, they don't normally have music on there, they put on a special show for her. Vicky, they had 120 guests uh, for a dinner show, and what a wonderful woman she is. And talked a lot about her dad, but I wanted to know more about her because a lot of people only kind want of to talk about her dad. dad. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, it's her turn. So yeah. are we going to see? We got a great, this great interview. Have a look at the cheeks and the eyes because she's got those glorious Johnny O'Keefe eyes, and yeah. she's just truly a delightful woman. So here's a great interview with her. Great. Hey, it's Susie here at and about for Rockdown TV, and I am at the glorious Baronia RSL, my neighbourhood. And I happen to find one of the most gorgeous rock chicks that you would ever see, Miss Gorgeous Vicky O'Keefe. Hello, darling. Hi, Susie. How are you? Now, you've just jetted in, haven't you? I have, yeah. all the way from the Gold Coast. So, everybody's going to say, we know who you are because you're JOK's daughter, yeah? That's correct. Would you have a penny for every time someone said that? <laughs> Look, I'm really proud of my heritage and Dad has left us all a wonderful legacy and I couldn't think of a better way than um, spending my life and playing music and writing songs. Now, Dad had you all classically trained, was it, on piano? Yes, yeah. he did. Uh, my brothers and myself, we all started playing piano when we were about five, so um, we, we weren't really sports-minded, but um, as far as music and practice, that's what we did for the next, like, 15 years. 
Now, you also picked up the guitar as a little tot. Were you about five or something oh, when that occurred? A little bit older when I, my dad bought me my first guitar and uh, we used to sit around the, the pool and, and barbecues and I'd start singing songs. So it's basically how it all progressed. And you often attended Dad's gigs, I believe. I did. We all did and we were really proud kids and I, I guess it was a wonderful lifestyle to grow up in, especially in the 70s and, and uh, the club scene in those days as, as kids. It was just so different to how it is now and Dad being such a fantastic attraction to the clubs and so well loved uh, by all Australians was just a, a massive draw card and um, such a wonderful performer and, and I used to just be in total awe myself just watching him perform. What is your fondest memory of your dad? I guess that the best times obviously are the shows you know we'd we'd go and stay with dad in school holidays and travel to Melbourne or to the Gold Coast and attend his shows he'd be booked out for um, like five nights a week in one venue so we always had fun and he'd, he'd always spend a lot of time having fun with us like going to Luna Park and you know having good kids stuff times together and basically he was he was our dad you know even though he was as well known and recognizable as he was in the streets he was he was our dad yeah. now tell me because you you've had some really nice experiences you've been support for the likes of say Ricky Nelson Susie Quattro she would have loved you you would have given her a run for her <laughs> in the leather what was that like what do you remember about that oh they were really really great times that was you know just after I'd lost my dad and basically I uh, got a contract with uh, Warner Brothers Music for Publishing and with RCA Records and um, I had the opportunity to work with those fantastic international artists and it was so much fun, such an experience. Um, you know, the music that that we were playing or that I played with my band then was very, very rocky and once again original material. So quite different to Rick Nelson when we supported him at Twin Towns and I think that, that the people were in for a little bit of a shock when we came on stage but uh, fantastic experience and I guess I've been pretty blessed and pretty lucky throughout my life. I think that you've, you've carried the name, the O'Keefe name with absolute pride it's just wonderful that we've got some rock chicks out uh, particularly with original compositions because it is very difficult to get your own music out there your original music well I, I think that's that's right it's one thing to write a song but then to take it to the next stage and actually record it and put it together with an arrangement I think that that was the biggest challenge with this album uh, getting it to sound the way that I wanted it to sound that I heard it in my head but as I said, you know, Susie, the first one's out and the rest can only get better and easier as I go along. Is there one thing before we go that you would like people to take away about your dad? One thing that you want people to know about your dad? Oh, I think everybody knew pretty much what a, a kind and generous person my father was and it was devoted to, not only devoted to his performance and his song, but to his um, family as well. So just um, just a, a lovely, lovely man. Yeah. you got his eyes. I do have his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Although I think as I, get, as I get older and a little bit darker, I think I'm looking more like my mum. Perfect blend. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> so one more plug of the album. I'm just going to get it. 50 Diamonds here. Um, please go on the website, go on Facebook and you can purchase this at Vicky's Gigs but it's an awesome album. I'm going to be playing it on both my radio shows so have a look out for this album and I'm really pleased and honoured that we got to have this gorgeous rock chick on Rock Down Out and About. And thank you very much Susie and I appreciate the interest and, uh, and it's just fantastic to have um, the enthusiasm from people like yourself. Yeah. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Over and out from Lockdown TV. Gorgeous. Yep. <laughs> what a gracious girl. Glorious, isn't she? Yeah, so calm, so wonderful. And what's her live show like? Full on her, or off? She is a, a bit of um, bluesy rock, uh, just gorgeous. She actually, she did um, the boat that rocks, is that what it's called, or the rock boat? And uh, the cruises. Cruises, yeah. yeah. And they actually had her, similar to Natalie Cole with um, Nat King Cole, and she was doing a duet with Johnny and they beamed up Johnny, uh, I'm counting on you. Oh. 
and I would really, really love to see that. But she was just something else and very understated and, and just very humble. We need to touch on the fact that the last couple of weeks we've lost so many legends, uh, not just in Australia, but all over the world in the music industry, but very, very saddened this John, week to lose uh, John English. John English. And today, unfortunately, John, um, Johnny Hawker. Um, Anne and Johnny Hawker, yeah. of course, uh, were amazing musos in, I guess, especially the 60s mm. and early 70s. Uh, Johnny Hawker had the Johnny Hawker big band and um, they had an amazing um, And my folks actually single. played with them back when my folks were musicians played. way right. back. Yeah, so um, firstly about John English. As you know, I had the absolute privilege of interviewing him mm. and it was very, very difficult to lose Hannah and then two days later, John English. So bless John English. Bless John and, English. And please, a round of applause for John English. <laughs> it's so sad. And... But we've got to keep going out and about. Yep. We've got to keep this train going. Because All the that's more what reason. We're here for. That's right, too. Document our wonderful musicians. As we bang on, I'm always banging on about it. But please go out and see these gigs. This one will be playing real soon down at... Um, the Palais, I oh, think. Oh, what am I going to wear? Ah, a bit of blue. <laughs> and Dusty, the Dusty show. I, I'm hanging to see that. So please do that. Just, you know, you're doing yourself a favour. Uh, this audience actually... Uh, fabulous. Got a glorious audience. Yeah. Look at all our regulars there. I just yeah. love you all. All the people here support <laughs> all of the gigs around Melbourne. We see regular faces all the time. And thank you for coming in. Yeah. Wonderful thank audience. You. And you're beautiful. Would you please thank the gorgeous <laughs> Susie Pinder. <laughs> Welcome back to Rock Town. My special guest this evening is the multi, multi talented Mr. Marty Roan. Thank you. And when I say multi talented, you have done so much in your life, it, entertainment wise, or well, probably otherwise as well, but do you want to see something cute? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, look yeah. yeah. Look at the the, uh, the singlet. I was actually doing Godspell at the time. I'd, I'd come out of doing national service. Um, Normie came out and I went in. The government wanted to keep up the pop singer representation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I was doing Godspell at the time. I um, was doing it with John Waters. Yes. And was Peter. This one of the original. Um, it was the original, the original. Sydney season. The okay. original Sydney season. Uh, John Waters, Peter Tapano. And later on, uh, Colette Mann joined, joined the cast. Um, and that was the start of my theatrical career. Well, we were talking before about your theatrical career, and of course, one of the highlights, I guess, for anyone in the whole world would to be able to perform on the London's West End. And of course, you did. You had one of the major roles in The King and the I. The King and I. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I'd, I'd, go, I'd gone to England in uh, 1978, um, just after Mean Pair of Jeans had been a hit. And I made the decision to, to go overseas, to um, broaden my horizons, see, see what I could do overseas. And I'd actually come back to Australia to do the Mean Pair of Jeans tour. It was about five months after I landed in England. And I was in uh, northern New South Wales, staying at a motel while on the tour. And uh, the, uh, the receptionist knocked on my door about 7 a.m. in the morning and said, Marty, there's a call from London for you. And I thought, <laughs> you're a call from London. Um, and I went to uh, reception, picked up the phone, and it was my... Um, my uh, agent in London who said, when are you back? And I said, well, next week. She said, are you interested in auditioning for The King and I? And, and I'd gone to England to further my recording, recording career. career yeah. And so I said, mm, I don't know, who's in it? And um, she said, well, Virginia McKenna, uh, who did Born Free and yes. Carve Your Name with Pride. I said, oh, oh that's interesting. Uh, who's playing The King? And she said, oh, little known guy by the name of Yul Brynner. <laughs> And, um, of course, I couldn't wait to jump on the plane and flew back over there. And I auditioned seven times to, before I got that role. I auditioned seven times. And anybody who knows anybody who's ever been through the auditioning oh. process, you know, Wendy, it's, 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 it's so yes. nerve-wracking because each audition you go to, you subsequently want, you crave the role more. Yes. The more times you get asked back. So you can imagine being asked back seven times to audition, by that stage, 
I needed the role, you know. <laughs> um, and the last audition was for the great man himself. Um, he was, unbeknownst to me, sitting right up the back in the stalls where I so couldn't see So he actually had the he, final say? He had the final say. And uh, I came out on stage and I sang I Have Dreamed out of the show. I have dreamed that your arms are Da-da. lovely. And What's that from? That's from The King and I. Of course. Yeah. And, and, and so... Um, <laughs> bong. And so... Uh, this booming voice came up from the back of the auditorium. Can you sing it in a higher key? And I'm thinking to myself, I'll do anything. I can sing it in any key. So uh, I sang it in a higher key and, and, and I got the nod. I got the nod from the great man himself and I spent the next 18 months doing the most amazing production in the most amazing theatre, which is the London Palladium. And it was not unusual. I don't want to sound like a name dropper, but this is true. Just about every week there was someone of some note oh, yeah. in the audience because it's London, it's because London, it's the West End there. and because it was Jules Brenner. Uh, just a, a, a few names that roll off the tongue. Um, Robert De Niro, Dustin Hoffman, um, Burt Reynolds, Sally Field, Cliff Richard, oh. Danny LaRue, uh, the late Princess Grace of Monaco, the late uh, King Hussein of Jordan and the royal family. And, and you're performing in front of these people. Uh, in this magnificent production. You know, it, it's something I'll never, ever forget. Oh, how could you? Did you know the show was going to finish? I mean, 18 months is a very, very long run. Mm. Mm. Were you, toward the end of the run, planning to either try and stay there and go into other productions, or had you already had it in your head that you wanted to come back and do... No, I, I didn't ha- have it in my head to come back. What actually happened was... The British Equity, the British Union, refused my work visa when I, when I was offered the role initially because they believed it should go to an English uh, actor. Um, and if it hadn't been for Bobby Lim, the late Bobby Lim, who was the head of our union at the time, the day, the day I was knocked back by the British Union, um, Bobby arrived in London. He came over to uh, our apartment for dinner and I told him the story. And he said, uh, meet me down at Australia House the next morning. We'll see what we can do for you. So I went down to Australia House. We met with the New South Wales Consul General, uh, uh, Mr Falkenberg, that morning. And we told him the story that uh, I was being refused permission to do, the King and I. So Mr Falkenberg gets on the phone, rings up. Guy at the other end answers the phone. He says, hey, Neville. He said, I got this guy here, Marty Roan, told him the story. It was Neville Rand. <laughs> the New South Wales Premier on the other end of the line, and I'm told this is a true story, Neville Rand says, tell the British Union that unless Marty Roan gets the part, there'll be no Englishman working in New South Wales as of this weekend. And Good call. Yeah. And, and uh, at the time in Australia was Max Bygraves, uh, Des O'Connor and all these people working our clubs. Yeah, doing all the, uh, yes. doing all the gigs. And, and, of course, so I owe it to uh, Nev and I owe it to uh, Bobby yeah. Lim, forget about it, but it didn't put me in, on very good terms with British equity. And within two weeks of finishing The King and I, I got, received a letter from the Home Office asking me to leave the country. As you do. As you do. <laughs> so, uh, reluctantly, I came back to Australia. Reluctantly because I was hoping to, to do more you know, while I was over there. However, having said that, I mean, the list... I'm, I'm not going to read from the list because it's... You know what you've done. You have done so many productions. Television, number 96. I'm just reading this. Class of 75, certain women. Um, and then I did the revival of The King and I here 18 months ago with uh, Lisa McEwen and uh, Lou Diamond Phillips. Of course. But um, I said, can I play the young lover again? They said, mm. no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> So I, uh, I played the Prime Minister. I played the Krala home in The King and I. And um, I was thankfully nominated for a Helpman Award for Best Supporting Actor. I read about Actor. that. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, we were talking in the dressing room before, and I must admit I have not seen this movie, but Susie Pinder and Marty were having a good old yak about it. A fabulous movie. Evidently, we've all got to see it, and it's going to be... It's going to be on shown. Channel 9 in October. Uh, Channel 9 have bought it. It's a a feature film that I made just before The King and I called Rise, which is a prison drama. And uh, I had to play um, uh, a prisoner who had an acquired brain injury. In other words, um, a bit like the symptoms you see with someone with cerebral palsy. And I was in two minds of actually whether to, to play the role because I was very frightened, not frightened, but I was very concerned that if I didn't get it right, 
if I didn't play the role with a great deal of sympathy and I didn't play it the way a person like that, the condition that they would be in physically, that I was on a hiding to nothing. That I was damned if I did and I was damned if I didn't. And so it took about two weeks for the director to persuade me to, to, to play the role because he, he wanted me for the role. And so I decided to do it. And then I just, for week after week after week, I just watched video after video footage of people with those conditions to try and get myself into, into the body of someone into that condition, in that condition. And, um, well, you it, must have done a good job because I love this next comment. Yeah, it was, it was really funny. We were filming uh, just near Ripswich in Queensland and I was told the story at the end of a day's shooting where the extras who came on set uh, said to the producers, we're really impressed that you actually got a disabled person to play this role. <laughs> That's a compliment. That's a backhand. You know, it's really fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, on Channel 9 in October. It's, the movie's called Rise. It's a, it's a prison drama and it got, international, it got released in Australia in the cinemas and played independent cinemas like the, uh, the Dendy Circuit and all that and it got released in the United States and um, it's going to be screened on Channel 9 in October. We'll all be watching out for that because I yep. believe it's fantastic. Susie was raving about it. We're going to take a short break. Be back with Marty to talk about your latest project, project. Yep. coming up. Be back soon. Hi, Mick Peeling here with another edition of Mix Picks on Rockdown TV. My pick for this week is a band from Perth, Western Australia, uh, called Birds of Tokyo. And this is their fantastic new album, Playlist. Now, when I first heard these guys, um, uh, way back, uh, I, they didn't really uh, strike me as anything uh, out of the ordinary. But uh, after uh, about three quarter way through last year when they released their uh, Anchors EP, that really did the trick for me. A great, great song, and uh, sure enough, this album also holds up with that uh, great EP, at the Anchors EP. Uh, great songwriting, great production, uh, a wonderful listen, and uh, these guys are just going through the roof worldwide. And if you haven't heard this record yet, you've been uh, living under a rock, and you should come out from under that rock and have a listen to this one, Birds of Tokyo and Playlist. Adios. I'm with Marty Roan. We've just been talking about your illustrious career and I, I sincerely mean that you have done so much. But now, uh, I think you are preparing to tour? Or you've yes, we're about, to, we're about to do the Legends of the Southern Land tour, which is also a celebration of my 50 years in the industry because we were talking the Stones before. It was 50 years to the day on February the 18th this year that I walked out on stage uh, as a support for the ah. Stones. Yeah. What a career. What a career. Okay, so tell us, uh, first of all, tell us who's in the production because this is fantastic lineup. Well, about uh, two years ago, um, I got a call from Johnson Peters. He'd written a song uh, with a young uh, songwriter called Michael Yule called Legends of the Southern Land. We actually came on the program, I, I think, know, and spoke remember, about it. Yeah. And we've always said, those of us who were involved with it, that it'd be great to, uh, to go out on the road with it. And... I mentioned to John that my 50th anniversary is coming up. He said, so, well, why don't we kill two birds with one stone? We'll do your 50th anniversary and we'll do it under the banner of Legends of the Southern Land. So great idea. So we got Swanee back to... Uh, Swanee, uh, John Swanee Swan, um, Ray Burgess, um, Johnson Peters, Tommy Emanuel via video link. I, I might explain that we'll to you. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Video link. And uh, Jimmy Couples from The Voice. And w I'm just excited to be going out with all, all my mates, yep. as you know what it's like touring, yes, when yep, you get yep. to... And it's such a great song. It's such a great song to, uh, to build the whole tour around. So it's going to be very exciting. So what, what will the other songs be? Well, what we're doing is we're going to do all our hits. Everybody will be doing their hits. But we're also going to pay tribute to uh, those guys who are no longer with us that we've shared stages with over the years. Oh, really? Guys like um, Thorpey, Doc Neeson, uh, Mark Hunter, Jim Keyes and Daryl Cotton. And, and we're gonna, each of us are going to pay tribute to, uh, to one of those guys. That'll be beautiful. And, of course, I, I don't know, have, have you got the video? Oh, we've got, we've got... Technology is an amazing thing. What we've been able to do through the production crew is I'm actually going to be performing with myself 
as are the other artists because what you can do with uh, technology these days is unbelievable. So while I'm singing, you're going to see me, circa that, singing up on the screen and they're able to actually lip sync them. And so it looks, it looks as if we're both performing simultaneously. Me, old me, old me I don't think that's such a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's going to be fun. And in regards to Tommy Emanuel doing it via video link, Tommy will be, be performing live with us on stage, but it'll be halfway around the world. Explain, please. Well, <laughs> what, what it is, is that Tommy will record his segment overseas, he will record his part, and we will play it back and we will perform with him on stage. Right, so is he living overseas? Oh, he's been living overseas for, and touring overseas for years. I knew he was touring. Yeah. I didn't know he, he, actually, no, he, he, he lives, actually lives he lives overseas. In the States? He lives in the United States, yeah. yeah. Any dates, for, especially for, I guess, the big one at the casino? Yeah, the one at the casino. The ones I can tell you, uh, that my memory will allow me to, is Geelong on the 2nd of April, Shepparton on the 9th of April. Then we got a break because a couple of the guys were unavailable. Then we do Crown on the 7th of May, as I said, my birthday. Um, and then we do Frankston on the 15th, 14th, 14th of May. Fantastic. Before we go to New South Wales. I was going to Queens. say, are yeah. you looking at going... Yeah, New South Wales and Queensland. Queensland. But hey, who cares about those states? Uh, yeah. Everybody. Yeah, of course. Everybody. And yeah. um, obviously, if that goes well, you'd think of taking it over to South Australia? And... Yeah, I think eventually. The, the, the biggest problem with doing a show like Swanee's this... big there, you know. He's huge in Adelaide. <laughs> As if... As if we didn't know, but I was thinking no, he is. Swanee's he, he's like huge. Adelaide's favourite son, isn't he? But the great, problem, peeling, of course. the great problem with doing a show like this is getting everybody available on the same, same dates yeah. because there's so much in demand. I mean, Swanee does a lot of touring um, and, and uh, everybody has their other commitments. I've got a, I'm, I start shooting a film here. This is why the hair is so short. I start f uh, shooting a film at the end of this month called uh, The Comet Kids, which the producers hope to be an Australian version of The Goonies. Uh -huh. And the reason my hair's so short is I'm playing the chief villain in the film. I'm playing a nasty person. I'm really looking forward to it. Do a, do a thing for us. <laughs> hey, keep your mouth shut, kid. I've got to use an American accent in the film because they're trying to sell it to the American accent. And I said to get, don't lie to me, kid. Don't lie to me. <laughs> You'll be brilliant as you always are. It's been wonderful having you here. Uh, we could talk for ages. Your career has just spanned, as you said, 50 years and still going strong. Uh, the Legends, what's the full name of the, the show? Legends of the Southern Land. Legends of the Southern Land. Keep your eyes And the Legends does not refer to us. I want to make that very clear because that would seem very presumptuous. The Legends is all about the great Australians that keep this country moving along. Okay. You know, all of the people that have made this country great, not us. It's been wonderful having you here. Marty Roan. Thank you. Now, just to show another facet of your marvellous talent, we're, we're going out with a film clip and this is not one of your pop songs. No, it's not. It's me playing Jack the Ripper in, in a stage production. It's a bit of a sad story connected with this. The guy who wrote all the music for Jack the Ripper, which was absolutely sensational, sadly, halfway through the recording of the cast album, he was diagnosed with motor neurone disease. And he, he was only given, I think, uh, about 12 months to live. And by the time we finished the album, a whole group of actors in Sydney, professional actors, including myself, wanted to put the show on before he died. And so we uh, booked the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the colleges there in their theatre and we did it for three nights consecutive with him in, sitting in a wheelchair in the audience to see the show. And it's just sad that the, the great music from this, uh, this uh, play may not ever see the light of day, but I think you'll see from this, this film clip just how good the music is. OK, we're going to take, take it out with Jack the Ripper. Marty Roan. <laughs> see you next week. Blood on my hands. Where is the blood of my mother? on my hands, I swear there can be no other. Now that it's started, I can't bear to be parted from the blade of my father. In his name I shall clear for the streets on the smear, and with fear I shall wash them with blood. I will not stop till the streets are clean And none of these women are left to be seen The 
night will be bright with the glint of my knife as it bears its sweet gift to the damned. Must be blood on my hands once more. I'll show them there must be blood on my hands. 